Hi, I'm Phoebe Xavier. I am the editor-in-chief and co-founder of 123Go Publications. And you can come find us at indieplanet.com forward slash 123Go. Thanks for having me on Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented person. She is, of course, the editor-in-chief and founder of 123Go Publications. We're joined today by the amazing and talented Phoebe Xavier. How are you doing today, Phoebe? Hi, thank you so much for the lovely introduction. I'm doing great. You know, uh, Jeff Haas, a, a fellow uh, creative person uh, that we both know, uh, suggested you to me. And I'm glad he did because I was looking at your um, amazing comics that you have in, under your wing in terms of your stable of comics. But for those that don't know anything about 123Go Publications and about yourself, tell us who you are and what you're all about. I am BB Xavier. Uh, P A X B B A Xavier is my my branding as far as as a writer. Um, but on Facebook, I'm just BB Xavier. Um, I've gone through way too many Twitters. You know, don't worry about that. Yeah, I'm a comic creator. Uh, I bought. I used to perform in uh, do a lot of music too before I shifted my creative focus into comic books. I do stand up comedy as an open mic comedian sometimes. I loved comic books since I was a little kid and that was always on my bucket list was like write the X-Men or something. And uh, while I may never get the opportunity to write the X-Men, I have found a lot of really creative people that I work with and on an awesome team called 123Go Publications. I am here to talk about that and talk about anything else that comes up. Uh, Jeff, who, who was mentioned is one of our writers. Uh, he has two books uh, on 123Go. Uh, Santa Claus, which was a two-part Christmas horror story over the last two Christmases, and Moloch Reigning Devil, which is a story about an angel who was sent to hell to kill Lucifer. He essentially succeeded before issue number one even started, and so the whole saga story is about him on his quest to first bring the legions of hell under his control, and then after that, bring the war to heaven's doorstep. So looking at 123Go Publications, you know, why did you want to found this, this publication company? I was working on Sidereal Apogee, and I think I already had two issues out. And I had started my second book, Trouble, The Scintillating, Ravishing, Razor Girl Trouble. I would started that, and it's sort of a spinoff of uh, Sidereal Apogee, but it's also a whole different book than it. Like the other one is a gritty cyberpunk anthology. She's more of like a lighthearted comedy adventure superhero book, but she exists in the same universe, the same uh, continuity or whatever. So I had those two books. I'd actually pitched Trouble to Image. Oh, Dark Horse, I think, and then um, Vault. I p p uh, pitched to like three different companies that like I would have been interested in having the book featured in. I didn't get picked up by any of those companies. So I was like, well, I'm just going to start my own thing then. I still wanted some sort of logo to represent like the series of books that I was going to um, start putting out. And at that point, it really it was just those two books. And by now, I think we have like six titles, maybe seven titles that we're working on. As a publisher, what sets you apart from other publications? I don't really know as far as like in the uh, current comic book ecosphere. I don't read a lot of current books. The books that I read are books of my friends that are they're working on. I picked up a couple X-Men books recently, but they're like X-Men books from 10 years ago. I picked up a Cyber Force recently because I was uh, looking at the Top Cow uh, contest again this year. I was looking at bring that possibly. Um, I wrote a, it's not Witchblade, uh, Darkness. I wrote a The Darkness issue that for uh, their contest a couple years ago. So yeah, I was thinking about doing that again, but I just, I don't like Cyberforce as much as I enjoyed The Darkness. Like I enjoyed The Darkness as a character yeah. and the more I read of Cyberforce, like the less interested I am in the characters. Meaning no ill will towards Mark Silvestri and the art is actually incredible in all of them, but like, yeah, I did not find any of the characters very compelling. Well, I like the one girl, the Velocity. Mm -hmm. She was kind of and I was also interested in working with one that gets cloned nine times or whatever with the green on her face. You be right about her, but like I was interested in her future clone version, not the version in the you know contemporary continuity. I, I thought The Darkness was a great series as well too. I love the the video game did a great job of the of adapting from the comic books to the video game itself. I thought that was really well done. I've never played that. Yeah. Yeah, there it was. Um, I believe it was an Xbox 360 game a while back or something like that. But it was it was. They did a great uh, service to the comic itself as well in, in video game form. So really fun to play with a little dark. 
Uh, my story, the issue that I wrote about the darkness was kind of about him confronting uh, mafioso people in Florida. And I just happened to have been researching a lot of the history of, uh, I lived in Florida at the time and had done a lot of research into the history of um, Florida mafioso. So it was easy to write that character against the backdrop of places I'd like been to and like already had a sort of geek obsession about. So then as a creative person that you are, what is the hardest part about being creative? Is it the beginning of an idea, the middle of a story, or, or maybe trying to wrap something up? Well, I think as a writer in general, I mean, I've taken a part of my fate into my own hands now and saying, hey, I'm going to put out books no matter what, even whether I get a big audience or not. Like my books will at least exist on the internet somewhere where you can download them. And I think that's right down there. As a writer, for me, is um, accepting rejection. It's going to take years to get good at anything, um, to get to that really master level where someone's like, wow, you're really fucking good at this. So if in your first four years as a comic book writer, you don't get featured in any anthologies or you don't get picked up by any company bigger than the one you make yourself, don't get discouraged because like taking 800 rejections is your job as a writer before you're going to get two or three that are going to send you in a direction that you're making good money on it. Yeah, I mean, rejection is tough, not only in, in life, but also in, in business as well, too. Uh, it, it's difficult, but we, we power through it as best we can in some cases, for sure. We're such a huge pool of creators. Like, everybody's out here trying to be the next uh, showrunner of the Marvel uh, Cinematic Universe. And there's only going to be one guy once a decade. Out, out of all the talent that's been on the show in general for the past 13 years, now I love everyone's different takes on, on how they're became creative in terms of say their own origin story <laughs> if we're going to go the comic book route there looking at say all of the series that you've created though if you could turn it into a movie adaptation what would your best series be in terms of a live action version and uh, who do you think you would cast as the main character that's interesting. I've thought about how, like, I would um, like to get my friends the franchise deal. Like, oh, cool, let's get, let's sell your character to some movie studio. Um, that's kind of the dream as a comic book creator, or uh, that's the going Hollywood version. Of that would be selling your the rights to your stuff to a studio, I guess. Which would be best? Oh, that's so hard. I've thought about um, sending in a couple of our Thirteenth Moon stories into um, the people who do Creep Show mm -hmm. on. Uh, Shutter as a streaming horror ser ser service. I really like Creep Show, and they actually use the same font on their like little comic book interludes as I use in all my books. So I'm like, maybe that's fated to be. If I could ever get my stories in the hands of those people, I think a lot of the Thirteenth Moon material would would work well there. We do have a volume two, which had a Kickstarter this winter or last October that did not hit its goal. And then disaster struck me when I first got out here to Nebraska, where I am currently. The first night I was here, I went to turn on my laptop, and for the first time in seven years of having it it refused to turn on took it to the local data recovery guy and he was like no i cannot do this but i know some experts you can send it out to so i wound up um, i found out yesterday that they're still recovering the data described to me as a slow motion defragmentation process that takes weeks there is some percentage of my data that will be um, recovered 13th moon volume 2 is on hold both because the kickstarter failed and then because now i've lost like 50 pages worth of lettering that I did that I'm waiting to pay $800 to get back. It just felt like such a loss when when, it, when I knew that I lost that data that I'm willing to pay $800 rather than having to relet all those pages. Looking at yourself then as, as a writer as well, and, and we can add this to any other creative process that you have, when was the first time you learned that language had power? Language has power. That's so different though. You don't learn that as a kid, like. Wow, that's a tough question. Like, I'm 44 years old now, and I do have, like, early childhood memories. Like, I remember, like, I was two and a half or something, or no, I was like, two years old when my brother was born. I have, like, some certain memory details of the, that that I remember. And then other than that, then fast forward a few years, like, I know there was a moment that I shocked one of my teachers kind of in school. I was in a silly, I was in the silly um, gifted kids program or whatever, where they take you out of class and you go... Uh, learn with a specialized teacher or whatever mm -hmm. and, and he had us doing scenarios hypotheticals about if someone was forcing you to do something i was like you can't force someone to do something and he was like what if they if they know okay so it was for, for uh, argument's sake let's say someone has a gun near mom said i was like you still can't force me to do it i could just tell you shoot her <laughs> like, i'm not gonna do what you tell me and i think that kind of like shocked him like, what <laughs> you're like a 12 year old kid that's fucked up <laughs> i do think that we manifest 
are realities and that words and thoughts lead to those realities being manifested. And that's something that maybe took me until I was almost 30 years old, properly understand that and not just like some hippy dippy stoner, new age sort of, that's a relevant real thing. Be responsible with what you say and who you say it to. So then in your opinion, what is the most important quality as a, as a writer in comics today? And how does that translate to your comics? For me, I think creativity, which I know KRS-One wasn't the first one to say it, but KRS-One said it's all been said before or something like that. You know, to me, what real creative storytelling is, is like finding new, interesting ways to rearrange tropes that even if they've been done in a particular genre, do it in a different way, do it a little bit better. Oh, I saw the movie the other day, Gasoline Alley with uh, Bruce Willis and it's uh, or, and um, the other Wilson brother, Luke Wilson. Mm-hmm. It was a really good, like, modern noir corrupt cop sort of story. It was all shit that I've seen done in other movies, but they put it, put it together well enough that I was like, oh, I didn't see that one coming, et cetera, et cetera. I enjoyed wasting this hour and a half on this. But then there's other movies that are maybe the same genre, same tropes, and they don't pull it off. Gotta have the right connective tissue in your story that, like, makes each twist and turn unique and or just memorable. Unique and hopefully both, yeah. You said you do stand-up comedy. How did that start? I was working, um, I had stayed with a a friend of mine, old friend of mine that I actually used to do music with, Bob Perryman, Robert Perryman in Portland, uh, Oregon. I had been traveling the country that summer, stayed with him and some of his friends in Portland, Oregon, uh, in the inner southeast, if anybody knows Portland at all, um, right off of Hawthorne. Bob liked to do drugs, um, still does as far as I know. He's like, hey, we're going to buy ketamine tonight. And I was like, okay, ketamine, I've been around it, I've done it once or twice, like, no big deal. And he's like, yeah, I'm going to buy an eight ball of ketamine. I was like, for Christ's sake, like, no one in their right mind can do, like, an eight ball of ketamine in a night. Like, that's like, it's not like cocaine. Like, ketamine, one or two bumps, and you're going to be wrecked for 10 hours or wrecked for four hours. And then, in any case, and then you're going to do it again. I don't know. So, yeah, I watched them for a week do ketamine and just say the most ridiculous things. So, I started writing down, like, what they were saying. And we started to write a TV show about it. And we were going to pitch it to Adult Swim. It was going to be, like, a 15-minute comedy. It's called No Habla Espanol. It's essentially about us being writers of a television vision show and sort of like whoever's in the writer's room has the power to control the reality of everyone else so it would be like whoever was motivated to write any particular episode was affecting the reality of the other characters and we wrote about a season of three episodes i already knew i was a writer i had a lot of written material accomplished at that point that he under my belt that's the so, yeah, yeah, cliche turn of phrase i was looking for um so that uh I knew that, like, I was a good writer, but I was like, but am I funny? And, like, the to me, the challenge to know if I was funny was, like, well, let me get in front of a uh, crowd of people with the expectation that they want to see if I can be funny, and let me see if I can do that. So I started doing open mics in Boulder, Colorado, which was where I drove back to after that trip to Oregon. Yeah, so in Boulder, Colorado, a little bar called Johnny Cigar Bar. I'm not sure if it's still there, but my friend Tobias Livingston, who is still there, was the host of that open mic. And that's where I got my start as a comedian. Usually when it comes to comedy, the the first set is always the hardest there. What was going through your mind when you first got up on stage? Well, I, I kind of took some jokes from the show that we've been writing to test them in front of them. What I Anything that I could translate to just pure verbal uh, presentation without like a TV show um, with it. And so I told some show, uh, jokes that were straight out of our um, uh, screenplays or our scripts. I also told some Mitch Hedberg jokes because I'm a huge Mitch Hedberg fan and I felt that like that's homage. That's not like stealing someone's material. And I also like prefaced it with, oh, and if it's okay now, I'm going to tell some Mitch Hedberg jokes. And they were like, yeah, sure. And um, I also told a bunch of dead baby jokes at that point. The dead baby jokes, a lot of them weren't mine either. It was just like shit that like, I I was a street performer already doing music in Boulder. So like you meet all these street kid traveler kids. I was a street kid traveler kid in my own right, in my own time. And so like, it was almost like a, like a how you meet meet certain street kids. Like, have you heard this joke? Have you heard that joke? And they're all awful, awful jokes, but you're just sort of like finding out if they've really been around as long as like, as long as the dirt on their face makes them look like. But yeah, so I did pretty well. Um, from And I was encouraged that maybe in the first five weeks of doing stand-up comedy, doing that open mic, I probably kind of killed every night and I kept writing more material. Eight years later, I have enough material to probably do 10 minutes um, of solid, good stand-up wherever I go. It's not my main focus, but it's still something I love to do. Here's one that I came up with um, just in the last week. You know, you can tell somebody that their dog is pretty, but the minute that you say that it's attractive, suddenly you're not allowed to pet it anymore. (laughs) 
So do silly shit like that. <laughs> I like that. That's great. But it, but it also shows the creativity of, of your, like what, what's up here. It shows the fact that you're able to go with the flow of any conversations and it, it makes your, your storytelling that much better. It makes your writing that much better. And, and, you know, you can interact with more people, no matter if they're an introvert or an extrovert. Yes. Um, creating in real time, innovating in real time. What was the first comic book that made you cry? Ah, oh, shit. I don't know. Maybe like, like an Alpha Flight book. Maybe it could have been something that happened with the X-Men. I don't remember specifically. Damn. What, what were moments that I was really sad about in comic books? Like I, I bought the Death of Superman just to, to buy it, but I didn't like cry because Superman died. I wasn't even that hurt when they killed Robin. I remember that as a teenager that I was like, whoa, that's a big deal. They killed Robin. But like still, it was just like, Ook. I don't have any feels for Robin. One of the books that is uh, always one of my all-time favorites that does play with your heartstrings as you go through it, Blade of the Immortal. Mm. I, I that some of the best art I've ever seen in any fucking Kung Fu comic. The young girl story and just these other general stories going on are in, in and around it. As much uh, human development as uh, there is gory, gory violence. The Netflix adaptation or the live action adaptation did a good job of it. I didn't see that. I think I saw like a cartoon version that someone tried to pull off at one point that I think they stopped halfway through. I should look that up. That's such a gory, awesome character. This one samurai ronin in Blade of the Immortal cut his wife's head off and sewed it to his shoulder and keeps it like under a bird cage, under a big cape. And it's like crazy. Like, oh, it's a great story. I'm a big manga and, and anime fan myself as well. So Probably Bebop. Uh, live oh, action. Yeah. I was disappointed. They didn't introduce Radical Edward until the last episode and she was barely in it. I felt like, yeah, the comedic side of it that was provided by Ed and Ayn was just really not there. And they introduced um, the main bad guy, um, Spike's main bad guy guy, um, like in the second episode, which was a, like a late reveal in the cartoon, like the last six episodes or something. Mm -hmm. The depiction of the characters was awesome. Like, I think they pulled off uh, Jet and Spike and Faye pretty well. But Faye wasn't in it enough and... Definitely not enough, uh, Ed and Ayn. Is there anything you'd like to showcase those that are watching and listening to this interview? One, two, three, go publications. I have a great team. We make comic books, indie comic books, do it yourself. There is a new book that we're working on. Um, it's called Viking Saga of the North. My friend Jose Diaz, uh, we found each other in like a comic book creators Facebook forum. I've been working with him for a few months now on, he just drew like 40 pages worth of incredible depictions, Vikings in doing Viking things. And he didn't necessarily really have it um, mapped out as a story in any way, but he was trying to depict scenes that would be historically accurate. I'm now in a process of like helping him edit that into a story that makes sense. His friend Douglas is in Germany. Um, I think they're both originally from Guatemala. Douglas is an expert, like an academic expert in Viking history. So like we have a pretty cool team where we're not half-assing the historical accuracy. We have a couple other books in motion as well. Um, 13th Moon Volume 3 is actually being made, even though Volume 2 is on hold until I get my computer and data back. I don't, um, I don't like center my transness or my queerness. I don't like, I don't think my identity should be like what sells books for me. I remember when we were launching 13th Moon Volume 1, um, that one of the creators was like, you should put that on it too, that you're trans. And I was like, no. I'm not the first like trans comic creator. I'm not the second or third. Like <laughs> it's pretty normalized actually in comic books. <laughs> I'm not trying to get a scholarship or nothing for being different. Like, yeah. Or being rare or you you know. It doesn't matter who creates the comics itself. Exactly. You should be buying yeah. comic books because it's good, not because who wrote it is black or queer or Eskimo or Canadian or Mexican. Exactly. And if you enjoy the comic, buy it and support the creator that way. That's what it boils down to. But if anybody wants to know, I'm a she, her, trans woman, and I'm bisexual. Anybody is welcome to know that. <laughs> At what point are we good enough? That's, that's a weird open-ended, um, like almost like a psychological test, Rorschach block, block sort of thing. Everyone's good enough to exist or, you know, just be themselves as long as they're not a piece of shit. Like taking out bad moods on other people or taking advantage of other people. So just in terms of general, like... Do I deserve to be here? Do I deserve happiness sort of shit? Yeah, everyone does, as long as they're not an asshole, not aggressively egomaniacal and all these other things, ways that, you know, a, a human being could go wrong. There are definitive moments when you are either good enough or not good enough to do certain jobs. As someone who's taken on this position of editor-in-chief, like, it is my job sometimes to tell 
people who I love, who are my friends, like that's not good enough. That story I need this part edited, that part edited. And if they're not willing to budge on certain things, then I have to start finding other ways, things that they will agree to that will get the story into a shape that I want to publish it. I had someone that I worked with on uh, one of the stories in 13th Moon Volume 2 kind of push back on like, I've never had an editor take this much of interaction on restructuring my story or changing the dialogue or this or that. And I was like, okay, cool. But I do. <laughs> like Now you've met one who actually like, I'm going to take the story that I think is maybe 70% of like what I would like to see published. And then I'm going to work it to up to 100%. When I get a story in my email, it doesn't necessarily mean just because you're my friend or just because you worked professionally in comics before that we're at some other form of writing before. Now I'm just going to automatically be like, okay, cool. Let's publish it. No, like I have certain styles and certain um, standards and I will apply them to the people that I work with, the what, product that we put out. What is the most misunderstood aspect about being an editor in chief? I think that a lot of people think that editing is just like the grammar and spelling. And that is like, that's some shit that actually, if you're like trying to be a pro writer, don't hand me anything that has grammar or spelling mistakes in it. Don't send me something that isn't formatted correctly. Like they're pretty basic, well understood industry standards that you can Google. Know that shit. It's like sculpting to me. It might be like a half sculpted um, story that I will then guide the sculptor to pull the perfect statue out of that block. It's, so what I'm saying is it's more like being a director than people might think. Um, more like being in control of the story than um, just someone who edits the um, the spelling and the grammar. If you have a vision or if you can guide their vision to what makes it a better story, then all more power to you. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's, I'm not I'm not doing it in some sort of dominatrix way where I'm like, I want to humiliate you by telling you your story isn't good enough. Like, that's not what I'm doing. I want to be like, we're going to make this better. You're awesome already. I like you You're you as a creative force. But we're going to make this better than I think that will be more successful in the long term with the final result that I've coached you to. What is something that every person should experience once in their lifetime? Climb a mountain. I would say that. Row down a river in a canoe by yourself. Get out there and live. What's the wisest thing you have heard someone ever say to you that has stuck with you in your varying careers? I have a number of quotes in life that I really like and that have stuck with me. One of my favorites, I was in uh, Brooklyn, New York. I was walking uh, down to the beach in Brighton Beach, me and my girlfriend at the time. And I think we were a little bit drunk and we were going to the beach to smoke a doobie. And we're walking across the biggest intersection right before the boardwalk and I thought it was safe to walk at that point. And I guess we were walking sort of when the turning lane had already been given the green light. And this guy in this truck that was like 15 feet, like off the ground, almost leans out of the, of the car as he like screeches to a stop. He had almost hit me. He just leans out the window, not mean. He wasn't even like angry or anything, but just like in an assertive, letting me know kind of voice. He was like, yo, cars hurt, homie. <laughs> And I was just like, whoa, I almost died. And he's right. They do. I don't want to get hit by a truck. So I say that now whenever I'm like driving and someone um, sort of walks out in front of me or I almost I have to change my tr uh, driving patterns to avoid hurting someone. I yell out the window at them. Cars hurt, homie. <laughs> There's another one that from driving that me and my friends um, were driving across Pennsylvania in the summer of 2016. My friend Seven, we had been staying with her, her mom for a little while in Shamokin, Pennsylvania. And we're driving east to Easton, where we we're going to go south then to New Hope and Trenton, New Jersey. On the highway going across Shamokin to, to you hit like Easton or whatever, um, I got cut off really bad by this guy with New Jersey plates. And so I just yelled kind of like um, Carol from Archer, the way she yelled. I was, you're not my supervisor. I kind of yelled, stay in your lane, New Jersey. For the rest of the summer, that became one of our catchphrases. Like whenever we saw someone like driving semi-erratically, we just yell at them, stay in your lane, New Jersey. And still, that's just uh, me, my friend Seven, and my friend Sidewalk to this day. That's like a way to greet one another or whatever. Um, I don't know. There's a lot of other quotes, though, and other phrases that have impacted me in life. Um, my personal quotes that I like, that I coined, that I like to um, bring up. Um, if you don't think you're the baddest motherfucker to have ever walked the face of this earth, you never will be. Um, another one is life is a very dangerous place and very few make it out alive. 
I have a few other ones I like that I personally coined as far as I know. And my other stupid quote on Facebook is like the one like 75% of all quotes on the internet have been made up slash Benjamin Franklin. What is one mistake that you'll never do again? I won't ever smoke a cigarette ever again. I smoked for 23 years at one point. Every time that I smoked a cigarette, it would hurt my lungs, my throat, and my mouth. And I was like, if this isn't lung cancer, I don't want to find out what is. And I quit within two weeks. It was like six years ago. And I definitely have much more lung power capacity at 44 than I did at 38. That's amazing. Yeah. Congratulations. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? In a lot of ways, I would say Isaac Asimov, um, that he was a sci-fi writer that I read very early in life, instilled a fascination with sci-fi for the rest of my life, and um, that I had already known about comic books, but when I got into narrative sci-fi, that yeah, that person probably impacted me the most insofar as inspiring me to want to be a creator of something as cool as he was creating. What was your favorite and least favorite Asimov book? I think... The Gods Themselves might be my favorite. Um, I think that it's a it's shit that sci-fi still almost still hasn't um, caught up to doing stories like that. That yeah, there are all these multiverse sort of stories across various continuities, but that his uh, multiverse sort of approach was he he looked at a universe. That was parallels to, parallel to ours, but was completely different because of the protocols of reality itself. Like molecules that could not be stable in our universe were like standard breathing air in this other universe. How the how an exchange of energy between those two was a huge plot point, basically in both realities. Our parallel reality didn't have humans. It had like geological formations that had three genders that had their own societies. For him to have written that back in the 60s or whatever, I don't think sci-fi writers are even that good these days so it's worse when he took the foundation series and he had already been all, all the way through to lightning post or or whatever lightning rod finally decided to go back and tell tell harry selden stories again and i think the first story he wrote about harry selden going back to selden in like the 80s or early 90s or might have been the 80s so he fucking died somewhere around there in the 90s i think yeah, the return to the Harry Seldon story, I think, was probably my least favorite of his work. It had a totally different tone and played more like an, a Star Wars Clones episode on Coruscant or something uh, that they made Trantor feel like more like what I observe now as the Coruscant scenes from Re Star Wars Rebels or Clone Wars and Rebels, I guess. Yeah, that he threw a uh, kidney transplant or, or something in the early 80s. Before that, that had become a thing. He acquired that, kept it mum until he died, and that his wife didn't really tell anybody either. And then I think by the time she died, maybe, that it became, like, uh, was released knowledge that became more well-known, mm -hmm. that he uh, slowly fought, fought that disease for a while. From a professional perspective, you have uh, helped publish many comics. You have your own website. You've done... You have a comedy career. You have done many, many aspects of your life that I'm sure we haven't even touched upon, like being a musician and all that other stuff, which means you have to come back on the show to talk about that. So from a professional perspective, you have done many things in your life and you are successful in that. Do you consider yourself personally successful? First of all, I don't think I've done many comic books. I think we have like about 13 or 14 and I'm pretty sure Stan Lee like oversaw the publication of 40,000 books in his life or something like that. Success to me is not, do I have a lot of money or do I have a lot of clothes or shoes or whatever? Success is uh, absolutely maintaining happiness like in yourself day to day. There's a formula for that. Um, I think it's not just one aspect. I think there are physical aspects, dietary aspects, outlook on yourself and um, your approach to other people. But yeah, I think being happy is success. I can go on Twitter and start arguments with people that have different political di uh, views than me. We can troll each other and get real mad at each other. Or I could just like block that person when they start trolling me and like be like, hey, I'm happy with life. I don't need that noise. Happiness and success, I think, are hand in hand to me. And I am successful as far as like someone who, for years, I, I've been on um, disability from the government and a homeless nomad traveler. Like when I started One Two Three Go Publications, while I did have some temporary places that I could stay and live, like basically lived out of a backpack and never was in any place for more than two or three months at a time. Then I still, you know, managed to work month to month over a course of years with a creative team of 
at least two dozen people these days. And some people have like cycled out and new people cycled in. We work on making comic books. Some people are a little bit more semi-pro, more actively making money off of comic books all the time. And some of us are doing it just for the passion and would do it like even if they were like me, having to shell out 200 to $400 a month to an art team to keep the semblance of a pro sort of thing going. Doing what you love, it helps with the happiness. And if you're going to measure the success on that, on whether or not I got accepted by Dark Horse or Image or Vault or whatever, no, not, none of that like really like stung my pride. It was just like, all right, well, we got to find another avenue to get my books out there. Whether or not I make twelve thousand dollars by or tw- and sell twelve thousand copies by tomorrow, like that's not as big a deal as to me as putting out as good a product as frequently as possible. I've said to Jeff before, I said to him a couple of years ago, I was like, I'm just waiting for an MF Doom year that like MF Doom as a rapper had been making music since the late 80s. And then somewhere around like 2004, 2005, just like blew up. And like everybody was listening to six different MF Doom albums. It was like, he had taken a long time to get all that material together. Once they know your name and know they like you, if you already have like 18 products out, you're going to sell that 18 products to like 100 new like fanboys, fangirls once they discover that they love you. Maybe your success doesn't even come until you're dead. Like so many people that are famous to us now. My favorite book, um, what would I could honestly say as an adult is my favorite book, The Master and Margarita, was never published until after the dude was dead by his wife because she, he was afraid he would get uh, killed in Russia for publishing what he was publishing. Mikhail Bulgakov. That to me is the best book that's ever been written that I've read. And that's a success to me. No one read that book while he was alive, except for maybe his wife. So like, did he ever get to taste or feel that success? That's not that important. Making the awesome product is what an artist's job is. And if you happen to get lucky enough to be uh, someone who is successful while they're still alive or, you know, or while they're in their prime or this or that, that's awesome. In the last 30 years, movies in Hollywood have been like so influenced by Philip K. Dick that if he would have done that while he was alive, I'm sure that would have changed his behavior. If he had any sort of perspective on how influential he was about to become by dying and leaving all these cool stories there. And I know that his children are involved in his estate and, the, and like the rights to his shit and that helped, you know, able to sell or produce that work. Success is not whether you're, you have this many copies sold. Uh, success is happiness, doing what you love, fighting the good fight. I, I was amazed about how many Philip K. J books became adaptations to film and television. It was, it it was incredible just to see. The first one was like, while he died, he died before Blade Runner was even finished getting edited. I think very first little K deck movie was the end of his life. And since then there have been at least like 12 or 15. (laughs) The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I think I just doubled down. And uh, we're not always double down. Sometimes we need to sit there and be sad, be in your feelings for a minute. That is okay. Uh, It is human to accept defeat. Maybe accepting defeat is an even intrinsic into moving on. Yeah, you got to pick it up and keep going. That might even be tactically why I have this ADHD approach of like, I'm doing 10 projects at once, or I'm involved in 10 projects at once. And like, I might only have enough energy to make progress on one or two of them in the course of a week um, because I'm still working a day job or working with these other trials and tribulations of life. So it's when one of those fails that I still have like eight other of them that I'm trying to still succeed with. Having a thumb in many pies it is a part of my approach to dealing with failure. It's a sort of ego, egotistical um, approach, but also helps you get pushed through it. The world isn't ready for it yet. That's cool. You know, like just because my idea was not accepted by these particular publishers at any given moment doesn't mean my ideas aren't fucking awesome. There could be a moment where they become massively influential. Who knows? Keep building. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's maybe as an editor or, or a comic book writer, maybe a comedian, who knows what they would like to do creatively, but maybe you've inspired them in some way, shape or form. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I think that it is just automatic. Inspiring people isn't, it doesn't have a definitive negative or a positive assignment to it. Like there are people out there that, um, a few years ago, marched in Charlottesville with um, tiki torches um, in, in a pro-racist, whatever the excuse they had to gather en masse, that has inspired other people to like think that it's okay to be a bigot. I don't think that um, inspiration is a how can you, an inevitable aspect of, to a degree, 
seeing yourself in other people like but it's just gonna always keep happening whether for good or for bad people are gonna pick idols people are gonna pick stories that they identify with or that they like have particular morbid fascinations other fixations that might be healthy in ways like that get them focused on self-care and self-love and then giving back to community i think the answer to this to me is maybe what we were talking about way back when about the power of the word and it's the power of thought as well that like manifestation um, what you focus on is the world you create. Similarly, people will always be inspired. The, the, the next generation will always be inspired by the previous few or, or a thousand years going back. You can have heroes, you know, from thousands of years ago. And yeah, so it's what the future generation focuses on is what's going to inspire them. And I hope that it's, I mean, I hope there are future generations. I don't have a lot of faith that there will be humans alive on this planet in 200 years. I don't think that's a reason to get downtrodden and to stop doing creative things and stop living life like there is no tomorrow, you know? I pay attention to um, environmental facts and the news coming out of Eastern Europe. I'm not necessarily confident that there are future generations slated to be born onto this planet. Well, I do hate to say this, Phoebe, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Before I let you go, where can we find you and how can we support you on social media? and everything along that line. So I would like to ask people to A, follow the Vikings book on Instagram. It is, I believe, Vikings underscore saga underscore of underscore the underscore north. I believe that is the at and, um, on our Instagram there. And that is run by Jose. Um, but we're trying to get a following there because I think that's the next book we're going to um, kickstart. So please add that there. I am like at BB123Go on Instagram, I think, but I'm not very active on Instagram. Uh, on Facebook, though, you can find us at 123Go Publications. And the one I really want you to look up, though, is IndiePlanet.com forward slash 123Go, which is where you can buy our books. And you can also uh, download two of them for free. I believe Gunmetal Black Ops number one and 13th Moon volume one right now are digital downloads for free. And the rest um, require purchase, um, but the digital downloads are only 99 cents. Well, again, Phoebe, thank you so much for coming on the show. I do greatly appreciate it. Of course, you can find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or talking.com And of course, more so on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.